Hi, this is John with Chest Freezer Cold Plunge, and in today's video, we're going to talk about how to get it right the first time. Six things you must know before building a chest freezer cold plunge. We're going to give you an overview, and in future videos, we're going to go into more detail. If you haven't already done so, please like and subscribe. You can join my Facebook group or check out my website. That information is in the description of the video up at the top or below the video. So what we're gonna do is uh, give you the five tips or six tips, and then we're gonna go into more detail about that. So uh, first of all, number one is safety. Number two is creating a plan. Number three is what kind of chest freezer do you buy? Number four is how to waterproof it. Number five is getting the water cold and keeping it cold. Number six is keeping your water clean. And then I'm gonna give you a bonus tip if you stick around at the end. So first of all, let's start out with safety. It's very important that you always unplug your chest freezer before you get in it, and also any related equipment or components that you're using that plug into an electrical outlet, those need to be unplugged. A chest freezer is a major appliance that plugs into an electrical outlet. It is not meant to hold water. So if you've got water in there, and in particular, if you've made a mistake and haven't uh, sealed it correctly, or if that water starts to leak somewhere, it could cause a problem. So the way to remain 100% safe is to always unplug it. And that's easily done. It just takes a moment to do. If you're working on your chest freezer cold plunge, also unplug it. It's a good idea to keep it unplugged when you're working on it. That just helps avoid any potential issue with electrical shock. So the next thing is to create a plan, number two. There are a number of things to think about, and if you can sort those out beforehand, it's gonna just make your life go a lot easier. So what are your specific goals? How, how cold do you want the water? Uh, how much time do you have to convert this or work on this? Um, what is your expertise? Where are you gonna put it? Uh, do you live in a house or an apartment? Uh, how much maintenance are you willing to do? These are a few of the things to think about. There's a lot more, but uh, those are a few things to get you thinking that will help you to figure out um, you know, what's, what, what steps you're going to take and what you need to do in order to create a chest freezer cold plunge. So the next thing you're going to think about is uh, number three, what kind of chest freezer do you buy? This is going to be driven by how big you are, what size do you need. Uh, you want to think about if you have the whether or not you can actually go down to a store and get into a chest freezer, or if you have to order it online, where do you buy a chest freezer? Is it okay to buy one online, or should, it, should you get one locally in a store? My preference is to always get it locally if you can, because that way you can look at it and make sure it's working and it's good before you get it. Uh, should you buy a used or a new chest freezer? That depends on your budget. Uh, I do suggest that you stick with major brands, and if possible, get a chest freezer that has a white interior instead of the bare metal interior. They just tend to have fewer problems, there's less that's required for the setup, and the components in those chest freezers tend to be of higher quality than the ones with just the bare metal interior. Number four is how to waterproof your chest freezer. Chest freezers are not designed to hold water, and every single one of them have seams. Uh, it's funny to me that I always get someone, or not always, but uh, once every few months, I'll have someone coming in saying, my chest freezer doesn't have any seams. And I'll say, well, look more closely, and of course, they always discover the seams, because that's not something that most people are actually thinking about. So as far as the waterproofing goes, some of this has to do with what country you live in. There are certain products available in the US that are not available in other countries. So the accessibility to the different products you have has a big factor. Your budget has a big factor. Some things that are available in the US at a fairly low price could be five or 10 times that cost if you're in another country, but usually there are other options that are available. So you just gotta know what those are. Uh, what is your skill level? What tools do you have access to? Um, do you have a new or used chest freezer? That will also determine what is the best way to go about sealing it. You know, and what is your budget? That always has a lot to do with things. And are you thinking long-term or short-term? When people tell me that you know, doing something is too expensive, I always ask the question, expensive compared to what? Actually, there's two questions. Expensive compared to what and expensive over how much time? Because if you're thinking short-term, spending you know, $20 versus $120, yeah, that makes a big difference. If you're thinking long-term, spending $120 might be the better way to go because guess what? You can avoid killing a $600 chest freezer. 
And what is your time worth? That's the other piece of this too. So one of the most common issues that we see out of all of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reports that I've had since my Facebook group got started in 2018 is uh, there's a lot of ways to seal chest freezers. There are a lot of products out there on the market. One of the most common things that people do is use caulk or silicone because it's the most readily available. They can get a cheap caulking gun and go at it. Guess what? It's also the most widely reported failure of all the products used. So some people will notice that failure immediately. They will, their chest freezer is filled up and within a few hours it starts leaking or instantly they can see it start leaking or within a couple of days they've got leaks or rust within that first week. Some people, the, you know, the, so that's the first part of the bell curve. We've got the other part of the bell curve where the vast majority of people are going to see problems within one to three months. And then you have a few people that make it three months to a year or maybe a year and a half before it starts leaking. But then that's still causing damage to a fairly expensive chest freezer. And then it's your time that you've gone into setting it up. And then I can count on one hand the number of people as of the making of this video who have reported after a year or a year and a half that they have a successful chest freezer set up with no issues. I've got a couple of people, uh, one person that said two years, one person that said four years, but they really didn't provide much more detail and they didn't go into, uh, they didn't answer all my questions that I had for them. But those are just reports from people who, this is what they said, but you know, that's the data that I've got to go in is what people are reporting. If you use a two-part epoxy putty, that's going to be a way more effective way to seal your chest freezer. So number five is getting your water and keeping your water cold. So if your water is too warm or if it's too cold, you're going to have problems. If it's too warm, you're not really doing a cold plunge. If it's too cold, it's going to turn into a solid block of ice and you won't be able to do your cold plunge. So uh, this really is driven by where your chest freezer is going to go and the climate that you're in. Are you going to put it inside or outside? What is the average ambient temperature? What is the hottest and coldest temperature range? And uh, are you looking to save time? Or are you looking to save money? So a lot of people will just, or I should say not, some people will just unplug their chest freezer uh, and they fiddle with that every day if they've got plenty of time on their hands. Unplugging it and plugging it back in is a way to go about it, but you do have to check the temperature on a regular basis and it is your time. And if you've got time, that's fine. If you want to be more efficient with your time, timers are very inexpensive and actually a temperature controller, which actually bases the temperature of the water based on the water. It's actually a feedback, uh, specifically feeding back on the thing that you're going for is the cold water. Those are not very expensive and in my opinion, a much better way to go about it. Number six is keeping your water clean. Cold water does not stop the growth of microbes and bacteria despite what some people believe. As a matter of fact, many bacteria or most bacteria can survive being frozen and then come back. It might slow them down, but it will not stop them. So a lot of this has to do with your personal sanitation practice. You know, there's uh, a lot of things that can, you know, poop carries a lot of germs. And if you're not just completely diligent or if you just make a mistake or if you're tired one day, you know, that bacteria gets into your chest freezer, that can cause problems. You know, I've seen reports from people that say my water is turning brown, green, gray, it's stinky, uh, it looks cloudy. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong with your water. And uh, somebody recently just told me, uh, literally like two days ago, that they had blood worms in their ice bath. And that's, now that's a tub, that's a barrel uh, that they use. So I, I, I asked them some questions. I haven't heard an answer back yet, but uh, blood worms in their ice bath. So if we're doing this to keep ourselves healthy, why would you not want to keep your water clean? Okay. You're doing this for your health. And if you've got water that's dirty, I've, I've had people with rashes, you know, there's a lot of other bacteria that can get you really sick. Uh, you know, uh, un unclean water causes a lot of illnesses and deaths around the world. And I know this is, uh, you know, we're, this is a first world problem to have, but uh, we do want to keep the water clean. And there's a lot of ways to go about that. If you just want to dump your water out every few days and change it out or once a week is needed, uh, that's a perfectly fine way to do that. If you value your time more because it's going to take time to chill your water down, there are better ways to go about it. So, and we'll talk about that in future videos. And here's the last one. The bonus is what do you do if you screw up? Making mistakes on a do-it-yourself project are almost inevitable. So if you do make a mistake, there's a lot of ways to get help or even prevent those mistakes from happening. Number one would be to join our Facebook group. Uh, we have a lot of very helpful people in there just all across the globe who are answering questions all about ch building chest freezers or building a cold plunge at home. And uh, we can help you there. If you don't want to wade through uh, 
all the posts that we've had on there, thousands of posts since 2018. You can uh, get my book. It is on my website, chestfreezercoldplunge.com. My book is the ultimate chest freezer cold plunge DIY guide, and it's available on my website. You can also hire me for a consultation. Uh, I can help you A to Z on uh, all of the things, planning, uh, getting a materials list together, and we can do that over the phone or on a Zoom call. If you're, in the, if you're local to Austin, Texas, I can help you come out and build your chest freezer. And right now I'm batting 100% long-term for all of the people who have helped build a chest freezer. If you wanna avoid all the potential mistakes that could happen and have something that actually does work long-term, that's another option. Please like and subscribe to the video. If you have any comments or questions, please post them below. Do check out the Facebook group and my website. That information is all in the description of the video. So happy cold plunging.